it's time to put the final touches onto our app. We have an interface that can adapt itself for various screen types and sizes, but the two major pieces that comprise its layout behave separately. We're going to use a view model to act like a form of plumbing to tie this all together. If this is your first time here, welcome to my channel. Every week, I give you season's advice on how to build professional Android apps in bite-sized chunks. Now, let's wrap this up. Let's begin by defining what our view model should contain. For this simple application, I'm going to have it contain two items, a number the user has selected and a flag indicating whether the user has ever selected an item. The selected value has a rather obvious purpose. However, that flag will make my job easier to decide when to show the detail view with a selected number. That way I don't have to resort to awkward conventions like negative numbers or something like that to indicate when a value was selected. Next, let's examine what kind of high-level user interactions I would expect to perform on this view model. Since I'm just selecting a number from a list and showing it on the details, I would boil this down to opening and closing a detail view. So from an interaction perspective, I would expect my view model to be able to do these kinds of manipulations to my state. Of course, this view model is simple because my app is simple. In a more complex scenario, I would probably want the data back in my list to also appear in this model. However, for this simple app, I decided to hard code those numbers into my view. Nevertheless, it's worth considering the other options that we have at our disposal. Now, let's move on to creating the view model in code. Back in Android Studio, I'm going to put my view model file right beside my other composable files. Ideally, for larger projects, you should consider having a package for all of your models. But to keep things simple, I'll keep my model close to the views. I'll create a class called Adaptive Layouts View Model and have it inherit from the Android X view model. This class will contain all of the business logic to manipulate my data, but I don't want it to serve as my actual container. Its role is simply to be the interfacing layer between my view and the actual model. Down below the class, I'll create a data class for this purpose to describe the state of my UI. I'll call it Adaptive Layouts UI State. This is where those properties that I mentioned earlier will live. I'll add in a property of number selected as a Boolean and set it to false. I'll add in a number from list property as an int and default its value to zero. My view model will need to hold a reference to this class and also be able to broadcast updates from it when one or more of its properties change. I'll do that like this. I'll create a private val called view model state and set it equal to a mutable state flow which receives an instance of our data class. I'll need to expose this state flow so that my view can access it. Conventionally, this is done by creating a public val with the name of UI state, setting it equal to my view model state, and using the state in function to start a hot state flow. I'll provide the view model scope as the scope parameter, start this flow eagerly, and provide a default constructed instance of our data class as an initial value. Let's start to manipulate our state with the two actions I described earlier. I'll create a function called OpenDetails that takes a selected number as an int parameter. Then I'll update the view model state by copying the original value and updating the number selected to true and the number from list with the provided value. For the other scenario, I'll create a no argument close details function that does a similar operation on the view model state. In this case, the number selected is false, and I'll reset the number from list to zero. Now we need to propagate this model throughout the relevant parts of our app. I'll open up the multimodal nav graph, and inside of the composable that takes us to the adaptive layouts route, I'll request access to our view model with the view model function. I'll do that with a variable called view model, specify the type, and set it equal to the view model function. Then I'll need to send that to our route. Similar to how we are handling updates from our screen classifier, I'll transform the UI state flow into a state. I'll create a val called UI state 
and delegate setting its property by calling adaptive layouts view model dot UI state dot collect as state. Like before, anytime the flow updates the state of this variable, it will trigger a recomposition in Jetpack Compose. With our state firmly in place, I can pass UI state dot number selected as the parameter to the to adaptive layout screen type function. Now, our screen type mapper will have the proper data to make the correct decisions. Ultimately, the parts of the screen that need access to the UI state variable are the adaptive layouts detail screen and its ancestor composables, such as adaptive layouts stacked and adaptive layouts list half and detail half. The only composable that doesn't require the UI state is the list, since it's capable of generating its own data. If this list was, for example, generated by a call to a server, then it would need the UI state to populate its data. But once again, since this is a simple app, we don't need it for this scenario. I've spared you the time of watching me update every relevant composable with a new parameter called UI state. But as you can see here, the route file now passes this new variable as a parameter to four of our composables. The intermediate composables, such as adaptive layout stacked, simply act as mediators to pass the state onto the detail view. There's nothing too complex going on here. I'd like to have my detail screen update itself whenever the view model's state changes. For this example, I'll surround my text composable with an if-else statement, moving the existing text into the else block. For the condition, I'll say UI state dot number selected. For the true scenario, I'll create a new text composable similar to the existing one, except the text property will use r.string.selectedItem for my resources file, and will provide the selected number as the second argument to the getString function. Now this value will show the number the user has selected once the first number is picked from the list. At this point, I have data going down into each of my views, but I need some events to bubble back up from these views once a user has interacted with them. For this case, the interaction will be selecting an item from the list so that the view model can update its state. We'll start in the adaptive layouts list screen and work our way back up to the top. On our list screen, I'm jumping straight to the row with number composable. I'll add a clickable modifier to the surrounding box and specify an on-click handler. I'll create a new parameter on this composable to start the process of bubbling our event up to the top. I'll call it onSelectNumber, and it will be a lambda with a single int parameter that doesn't return anything. I'll call that lambda from my onClick handler of my modifier. Of course, I'll need to propagate this the whole way up. Back in the adaptive layouts list screen composable, I'll add another onSelectNumber lambda with the same signature as a parameter. I'll set this lambda as the second argument to my call to the row with number composable. Next, I'll go into all of the intermediate composables and make the necessary updates there. Just like the list composable, they will need their own onSelectNumber parameter to bubble the event handler up to a higher level. Back on the adaptive layouts route, we're at a place where we can finally handle these events. I'd like to make one small change to keep things a bit more tidy. I'd like one function to manage updating the view model based on the events received from the view, and another function to manage what we're currently doing with laying out the view based on the given screen classifier. I feel as though doing both state management and view classification in one function could get confusing and would dilute the meaning of both of them. This is more of a personal preference, but I feel as though it makes the end result more clear. Beneath this composable, I'll add another composable function with the same name, but with a different signature. It'll need the screen classifier, the unwrapped UI state of type adaptive layouts UI state, you'll see why the type changed in a minute, and our friend on select number one more time. I'll then move everything from the top function into the bottom function, except for the UI state variable. I'll also wire up the on select number to each of the composables that need it. What do we gain by doing this? Well, you'll see once I fill out the top function. I'll call the second composable from inside of the first one. It'll get the screen classifier, the unwrapped and ready to use UI state, and for the on select number parameter, I'll just give it a lambda. Inside of there, I'll call open details on my view model and pass in the supplied number.
Now you can see that all of my event handling is happening here and it doesn't get lost inside of the switch statement cases. Plus, since this onSelect number is getting passed to multiple composables, if I ever need to make a change to how I handle this event, I can do it one time here instead of multiple times in the code below it. Let's see what this looks like on a real device. I have my foldable with the current state of the app already loaded. Let's try it first in fully open mode. You can see, whenever I select a number from the list, I'm taken directly to the detail screen with the selected number on display. That's our first time seeing the screen on a smaller device like this. Let's try going back. You can see it took me back to the app home screen, but not to the list of numbers. That's something we're going to have to take care of in a minute. Going back to the list screen, I'll scroll my list down a little bit, fold the device, and see what happens. If you'll notice, I've jumped to my folded state, but the list has jumped back up to the top. And that's one more thing we're going to need to fix. Google recommends not changing your state of your UI unnecessarily whenever changing postures. Nevertheless, this is looking pretty good. Pressing on different numbers on the left causes the state to update every single time on the right. If I go back, you can see I do land on the home screen as I would expect. So it's only for smaller devices with the full screen details that has a problem with the back button. I'll go back to the list, select a number, and then open up my device fully. As you can see, it takes me to the detail screen, which is a sensible decision since I've already selected this number. I'll fold my device once again, go back home, and go into the list one more time but this time I'm not going to select a number. If I open up the device fully, you can see it keeps me on the list of numbers, which is a good choice since I didn't select the number. We're looking pretty good right now. Let's go and fix those last two issues. The back handler issue is easy to fix. As mentioned earlier, this only happens on compact and medium devices, which display the details in full screen. For the second adaptive layouts route function, I'll add another function parameter called on back pressed, which doesn't take any argument and doesn't return anything. Down below, for the detail only scenario, I'll add in a back handler block. This will allow us to provide our own custom behavior whenever the back button is pressed for this scenario. Inside of there, I'll call on back pressed. In the first composable at the top, I'll implement the behavior of this callback. I'll use a lambda, which calls the close details function on my view model. One problem fixed and one more to go. To retain the scroll position of the list whenever the device's posture changes, I'll create a val inside of my second composable called list state and set it equal to remember lazy list state. This variable will need to get passed the whole way down to the lazy column on the list screen, so I'll have to update all of the corresponding composables to accept this parameter. Once again, I've updated all of my composables except for the adaptive layouts detail screen, since that is the only one that doesn't reference that list. Finally, on the adaptive layouts list screen itself, I'll pass that argument to the state parameter of the lazy column. One last time, let's run our app and see if our issues are corrected. I'll only look at what we fixed this time. Keeping my device flat, I'll select a number from the list and try to go back from the details view. This time I landed on the list, which is what I intended. I'll scroll down a bit and fold my device. And as you can see, the list remembered my scroll position between posture changes and didn't jump back to the top. And with that, we've wrapped up the last few details for this course. Thank you for coming with me along this journey. I hope that you found it insightful as you go and build your apps of the future for every kind of Android device that will hit the market. I invite you to join my Discord group to discuss this course with me and with others who are in your shoes. Stay curious, stay sharp, and as always, happy coding.